Hi everybody, welcome back. We're looking today at Jeremy Duff's Elements of New Testament Greek and we're looking at the topic of questions or rather a particular kind of question. We're in section 10.2 which is headed slanted questions. Let's just think about what this means for a second in English and then we'll look at these uh, examples on, uh, on the board. Um, suppose I ask you a simple question. Are you studying Greek? Well, that's uh, expecting one of two answers. Yes or no. You might be at your desk. I come along. Are you studying Greek? Uh, yes, I am. Or no, I'm not. And either of those answers would be exact, would be entirely in keeping with what I'd be expecting, given that I'd asked that question. However, in English, as in Greek, there is a way of asking the same question. Are you studying Greek in a way that I'm expecting either a positive answer? Yes, I am. Or a negative answer? No, I'm not. So let me give you some examples. Um, you're at your desk and I come along and see what you're doing. And I'm, I ask the question in such a way that I'm expecting you to answer no. I might say, you're not studying Greek, are you? And you notice that there's something about the way in which I'm asking that question, which is, it's still a question, but I'm asking it in such a way that it's clear what answer I'm expecting. You're not studying Greek, are you? Equally, I'm, I could ask the question in such a way that I'm expecting the opposite answer. I'm expecting a positive answer. I could come along and you're sitting at your desk and you're studying away and I could say, you're studying Greek, aren't you? And clearly, if I say, you're studying Greek, aren't you? I'm expecting the answer, yes. Whereas if I say, you're not studying Greek, are you? I'm expecting the answer, no. Now, just think about what we do in English in those two examples. We put the word not in somewhere. You're not studying Greek, are you? Or you're studying Greek, aren't you? Aren't, are not you. In both cases, we put the word not in, somehow or another in the sentence, in order to indicate which kind of answer, positive or negative, we're expecting. It's quite hard for us to work out why you put the not in that part of the sentence or that part of the sentence to expect a negative or a positive answer but it kind of works intuitively for us and here's the crucial thing if I give you the simple question are you studying Greek and then say now rephrase that in a way that expects a positive answer you could probably think quite quickly of one or two ways in which you could phrase that that expect a positive answer. And then if I gave you five minutes, you could probably think of half a dozen more ways if you're being more fluid and, with, uh, and being prepared to paraphrase the question a little bit more. In other words, we have many ways in English of expressing the idea that we're expecting a positive or a negative answer to a question. We can ask what are called slanted questions. Well, it turns out that in Greek it's possible to do exactly the same thing. And you do it in much the same way. You stick one of the words for not into the question and the particular word that you choose indicates whether you're expecting a positive or a negative answer. Let me illustrate using the two examples on the board here, which are what Duff has got right there on page 116. I encourage you to read this section from Duff. It's particularly good, very helpful. And I'm gonna give you a couple of other tips that he doesn't mention to try and help you remember which of the two question words, so to speak, expect respectively a positive and negative answer. Let's take a look at these though first. First, this one. Me kai humes thelete hupagain. Me kai humes thelete Hupagain. Well, what does this mean? Duff translates it for you. Um, but what I want to do is to ignore um, this at the beginning, because this is the word which slants the question. So let's ignore that. And we'll also ignore the chi for a second, because that, that in this case, it means also rather than and. The general rule there is that chi means and, except when it can't mean and, in which case it means also instead. And you know that because I mentioned it in another video donkeys years ago. So let's look at the, the body of the sentence from the humes. Humes, you, theleta, you want or you wish, hupagain, to depart. It's from hupago, to depart, it's the infinitive, hupagain. So you want to depart, question mark. 
So if you were just translating this portion of the sentence, you translate it, do you want to depart? Question mark, in the sense of do you want to leave? Right. Now, just we'll pop the also in just to make sense of that portion of the sentence uh, as well, for completeness sake, because Doff's got it here, although uh, it's not really necessary for our purposes. It comes in here. Do you also want to depart? It's a quote from um, John 6, 67. That's why he's included it, because he's going with examples you actually find in the Greek New Testament. Right, now here is the crucial moment. We have to work out what this does. And the negative particle me, when it appears at the beginning of a clause, which is a question, slants the question so that you're expecting the answer, no. Me, no. Just think of it like that. I'll say it again. When you get me at the start of a question clause or a question sentence, so that it's slanting the question, it's slanting it in a direction that, that expects the answer no. So what you now have to do is, having translated the question in a way that's not slanted, now you have to think of a way to translate it so that it is slanted. The particular way in which you do this is kind of up to you. And this is one of those moments where you start to see that the actual task of translating from any language into another, English into Greek, Greek into English or whatever, is more of an art than a science. You have to work out what would be an elegant and appropriate way in the context in which the text is written to make this into the same question expecting a negative answer. The examples that Duff gives, I think the, the first one is certainly um, the best, it's the most economical. Uh, he says, you don't also wish to go away, do you? Question mark. I'll write that um, uh, under here just so we can look at it and see how it works together. Um, you don't also wish to go away, comma, do you? Question mark. No, notice how um, this uh, produces the sense of expecting uh, a negative answer. It's that bit and that bit, the don't and do you. And you can imagine there are other ways of doing it, but the important point is, and this is what Duff says, where is it? Um, uh, yeah, the second or no, the third paragraph, when he says, in English, we have various different ways of expressing these type of question, often involving tone of voice. What's important is we understand the meaning conveyed by the question, which is what we've just done first. And then second, we find some suitable way of putting it into English. That's what that is. You don't also wish to go away, do you? Okay, makes, all, makes perfect sense. Right, so that's one way of slanting a question in the meh, no direction. However, you could also slant this, uh, a question in the opposite direction. If you slanted this question in the opposite direction, you'd be saying something like, you also wish to go away, don't you? You see, you're expecting a positive answer. You also wish to go away, don't you? You put the don't at the end, and it kind of feels right, doesn't it, in English? Well, let's try it with this sentence again, because this is the one that uh, Duff gives us. It's from John 7.25, with a change of colour, just for a bit of variety. And again, what we'll do is we'll ignore this. <laughs> let's change to a colour that works. Oh, my pens are dying today. Uh, there we are. We'll ignore this for the time being, and translate this bit. This also gives us a bit of practice with the old relative pronouns we were looking at before. Hutos estin hon zertusin? Question mark. This he is, this is hon zertusin. Well, he's got a relative clause. Let's translate this. This is, well, zertusin from zerteo, zerto, zerte, zerte, zertumen, zerte, te, ze, their tete, their two sin, um, they are seeking. 
And this, the hon, well, the way we translate relative pronouns, remember you just write who, whom, which, because you're going to need one of those words. And then you work out how does this relate to the verb here? Well, it is the object of the verb because it is the accusative, uh, it's masculine and singular, so it's going to be whom, uh, because it's the object and we want uh, not an impersonal one like which, so uh, this is whom they are seeking, and as Duff actually notes on the previous page, often when the uh, uh, antecedent is a part of um, hutos, as well as some other um, pronouns, um, the object will be omitted in the main clause. Just turn back and take a look at that if you need to, in page 115, just to remind yourself. This is, and we might say in English, he whom they are seeking, or something of that kind. What is, um, uh, Duff just says, this is whom they are seeking. Well, that works okay. Um, I think probably he whom they are seeking makes the, the sense a little bit clearer. Um, notice um, nominative nominative in English because the verb is is so it doesn't have an object it has a complement instead in the um, uh, in the uh, nominative so this is he whom they are seeking but okay fair enough let's just omit that because then we're doing it consistently with the way Duff is doing it right now what do we do with this okay well ook or u or uh, ook when they are located at the start of a clause, which is a question, um, then uh, we'll come to turning this into a question in a second, don't worry. Um, and no, in fact, forgive me, let's do that right now. Um, this is whom they are seeking. Um, let's turn it into a question. Is this he whom they are seeking? There we are, turn that into a question. Is this whom they are seeking? Is this he whom they are seeking? Right, ook or u or ook. What does that do? It turns the question into a slanted question, expecting the answer, yes. Right, so what, how does that work? Well, um, we just have to use our imagination and creativity and alter the form of this question so that we're expecting the answer, yes. And we do something like, this is he whom they are seeking, isn't it? Or something like that, what does Duff do? Yes, this is whom they are seeking, isn't it? So this, oh dear, is... He whom they are seeking, comma, isn't it, question mark. Right, there we are. So what you notice is the mayor tweaks the question, slants it so that you're expecting the answer no. U or uk or uch slants the question so you're expecting the answer yes. This is he whom they are seeking. Now. How do you remember this? How do you remember which way round they go? Well, the way that I remember, and I don't know whether this helps you, I just look at the no and the mare, and I observe these letters look similar. No, mare, and they're adjacent to each other in the alphabet. So mare, no. Mare expects the answer no. And U, yes. And I somehow find it easy to remember something like, oh yes, are you enjoying your Greek lessons? Oh yes, oh yes, me, no, m, n. Maybe that helps you, maybe it doesn't. But back to the key lesson from this, uh, the way to translate a slanted question is to translate it first as a statement, which is what I did here, and then I forgot to do the second step, turn it into a question, and then once you've turned it into a question, find some way of turning it into a slanted question, expecting the answer indicated by the presence of mer, which expects no, or u, uk, uk, expecting yes. Right, sorry about the scruffy writing there, it's a bit of a mess, isn't it? Hopefully that's helpful. Uh, keep working at this, 10 minutes a day, 25, 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, five, six days a week, and we'll have you doing this stuff in no time at all. Come back in the next video, and we'll start looking at direct and indirect statements on page 117. But for now, God bless, and bye for now.